I want to thank uh, the rest of today's speakers. Um, I, I'm going to make a few uh, reflective comments because I've been listening intently all day. It's been quite a fascinating and stimulating day. Uh, I want to begin with, with Dr. Cin Cindy Blackstock, our keynote speaker who gave the Fraser Mustard Lecture. There were so many points to reflect on, but the ones that stood out in my mind uh, that she she charged us to pay attention, not just to the blatant colonialism, but evidence of invisible colonialism. You know, examples that we don't notice even though they're present. Uh, we are focusing on a current pandemic of COVID-19. That was a running theme throughout the day, but, but First Nations people have experienced pandemics long before COVID that wiped out 90% of a population of 65 million. Just staggering. Uh, reconciliation does not mean I'm sorry. That might be a beginning, but it's certainly not the end. It means action to address the many socioeconomic determinants of health discrepancies that hamper the growth and development of First Nations kids today. Uh, an interesting thing that, that caught my, 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 my ear, that the residential school experience was a perverse form of foster care. And, and uh, Dr. Blackstock made the, the very cogent point that if you address those socioeconomic determinants of health, uh, clean water, you know, address poverty, uh, address educational discrepancies, substance use, uh, access to the internet, uh, that the need for foster care evaporates. Uh, and uh, one more thing that she said that that certainly will drive me to be thinking differently about, about things that I've thought of before, that this is no time for incremental steps. Uh, Blackstock called for a giant leap. And that's, that's a thought that will stick with me. Our first lightning round uh, led by Dr. Jill Zwicker and, and featuring research by emerging scientists, Samantha, Christopher, Aaron, and Preeti uh, gave us uh, quick but meaningful summaries of their research and we want to encourage them to keep on going. Our afternoon panel, which you just heard on service delivery, uh, provided a very stimulating and apt capper on day one. I, I think, you know, the, the, the running theme is that it, it is, is the astonishing development of virtual care, uh, the good, the bad. But the thing that, that I've taken from this is just how much development has occurred on the virtual uh, care and the virtual assessment file in such a short period of time. It truly is astonishing. Uh, James started us off with a stark recitation of what happened the moment the pandemic was declared genuine anxiety among students and then he deftly pivoted to kids with uh, neurodevelopmental challenges what they faced and it made me think immediately of my own son Alex uh, whose sleep-wake cycles were totally devastated by by the lack of that of that school routine. He lost peer support. He was very very fortunate to have tutors that allowed him to continue his education and graduate from high school. Uh, Tracy Moisen, uh, facing a family crisis, uh, one kid kicked out of school. Uh, you know, it, it it was a heartfelt story that we needed to hear, uh, and and. Uh, you know, the, these kids that she has who have FASD experiencing the typical things that I've seen in my own son, anxiety, sensory processing, intellectual issues, plus the adoptive issues that we too have experienced because our son was adopted from an orphanage in, in Russia, uh, early disrupted attachments, uh, and, and a support structure that was not virtual at the time, it crumbled. Uh, the, the physical support structure and, and the regression that is not surprising uh, that it occurred uh, with an increase in anxiety and depression. Uh, some of the lessons that she provided uh, that, that for us, I think, are, are, are telling uh, that, that Zoom calls can sometimes work and sometimes they don't work. Uh, you know, what did work? You know, the workers themselves didn't have the, didn't have the answers but they were able to adapt in real time. And so they had uh, virtual private networks uh, providing uh, occupational therapy, uh, Zoom counselors, shorter sessions, just more frequent but shorter contact, that helps. Uh, virtual youth groups, uh, emergency respite, she identified as something that is needed, wasn't always at its best, but it's something that is needed. And so hiring respite workers, if you have the financial ability to do so, uh, provided immediate relief. And that's something that the publicly funded system needs to think about. You know, I'm thinking about our own situation with our son, Alex, uh, Ed Shirley, who's a behavioral analyst. Uh, he, you know, we bent the rules when it came to COVID-19. He came over and was, and provided a lifeline. He was wild 
wise enough to recognize that Alex is a kinesthetic learner. And so lectures by, by virtual just didn't work. He came over and they built things together and went on walks together and, and, and he gets it. Uh, Don Colvin, uh, Alec, my son Alex's uh, art coach, um, you know, I, I, I think that if Alex had lost his three or four hours a day of, of uh, building things like the, the electric bicycle or electric cycle that he that he built that i've shown on 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 twitter um if he didn't have the opportunity to do that uh he'd have been devastated and so i i you know i think one of the important lessons that that i learned and certainly from listening to tracy is that you have to bend the rules where it's appropriate um you know we found that virtual talk therapy didn't work and i and i wouldn't be surprised uh, that tracy felt the same way uh, I, on the other hand, there were some positives. Waking up our son each morning and being there every morning to see the ups and downs certainly makes a difference instead of going to work and, and missing all of that. Um, the other thing that Tracy mentioned that, that, I, that I won't forget to say uh, is that it's a privilege to be able to afford to have technology, to afford it, and to be able to pay for services out of pocket. Next, we had Dr. Jessica Bryan, a psychologist at Holland Blue Review. Uh, she talked about pivoting rapidly to virtual, play-based, parental-mediated intervention. And, and the long-term goal to become virtual became the short-term emergency because of COVID-19. Now, not only do they have virtual therapy, they have virtual training. Uh, and the key, she said, was building trust and being adaptable. Uh, to Chaya Kulkarni at Sick Kids, nurturing the seed. Uh, children uh, from the ages of zero to six, uh, a program for vulnerable kids, um, which is being pioneered in Indigenous communities. And it's developed for kids on the wait list for months and years, if they're lucky. And that was a running theme uh, in this, in this uh, uh, panel session. The program uh, that understands the child's developmental needs and, uh, and provides appropriate supports, and it has an Indigenous lens. Uh, I saw that as a direct response to Cindy Blackstock's pleas in the morning. Uh, one thing that, that Chaya said that really stuck out for me, parents uh, as the greatest gifts a child has. Sometimes we don't feel that way, do we? But, but we are, and it was nice to hear that. Uh, the other thing that she mentioned that I think is important to remember, it's a process issue, but it's important that it's difficult to do data entry in communities during a pandemic and and so there will be losses in the development of these programs virtually uh, and 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 that was an important point to make next we had Brian Katz uh, from the Center of Child Development uh, and he talked about pivoting from acute crisis uh, uh, service provision virtually to making it a new normal and developing a COVID response plan that, that demands individual approaches. Uh, and, and he talked about uh, developing new ways to address barriers. And he said something that, that, that certainly stuck in my mind, we are not going back. Things are not going to go back to the way they were before the pandemic. Uh, and then uh, uh, the last panelist before the uh, question and answer session, Alex Munter, uh, who is the CEO of CHEO, and I've, I've certainly met him before. We've shared many platforms and I've had the opportunity of visiting and seeing the complex care program Program at CHEO, uh, he, he said, he talked about kids being the least infected, but the most affected by COVID-19. Uh, he talked about the entire trajectory of kids' lives that will be affected inexorably. And this is something, this isn't just for kids who are neuroatypical, it's all kids. And, and I worry, you know, right now, one of the hot topics is the, the, the quality or the degradation in the quality of primary medical education for our undergraduate medical students as a direct result of the pandemic. So everybody's been affected, but certainly neuroatypical kids are at risk of being more affected. He mentioned that Ontario has 165,000 kids with neurodevelopmental disabilities, and they are waiting longer than is, a clinic, than is clinically appropriate if they make it onto the list, if they aren't ignored. Uh, there's money that's been provided for deferred surgery. He said nothing has been provided for developmental therapies, and that is a major omission that needs to be addressed. Uh, there are unconscionably long waits uh, where every day of delay has a devastating impact on these kids. Uh, he talked about immunization delays. Uh, he talked about PPE for congregate care settings. Uh, and he talked about the need to pivot away from uh, process uh, develop, you know, delivering services 
to to securing resources for outcomes first. Uh, there was a great question and answer session after that. It was a very, very stimulating session. And I want to thank James uh, for curating it so well and the participants for making it uh, such a productive experience. That concludes day one's formal presentations of the Kids Brain uh, Health Virtual Conference. And I want to give a big shout out to our sponsors once again, Simon Fraser University, Claret, the Azraeli Foundation, Queen's University, Can FASD, Holland Blue Review Kids Rehabilitation Hospital, uh, the Ontario Center for uh, Excellence for Child and Youth Mental Health, CYMH, uh, Gather, uh, Family Support Institute of BC, and finally, the Michael Smith Foundation for Health Research. Uh, the day, my, my, my portion of the day is almost done, but the day is not quite over yet. If you haven't already, use the link I understand that I'm geographically challenged. Use the link in the top right-hand corner on your screen to explore the poster uh, walkthrough videos for the upcoming poster session, which will take place at 4.45 p.m. Eastern time. That's 1.45 p.m. Pacific time. Then head over to the free Gather Town platform for an in-depth one-on-one discussion with poster presenters about their research. And let me tell you, there are some really good poster presentations. Here's a quick introduction to two of them for you. Uh, the Université de Montréal's doctoral student, Marie uh, Yves Briand, is presenting in utero exposure to sterile inflammation and its association with altered neurodevelopment. And Melissa Tremblay, uh, faculty investigator from the University of Alberta, will be presenting her poster on supporting Indigenous families to foster healthy child development through the early years program, obviously echoes of today's uh, major presentations. You won't want to miss either of these. Uh, tomorrow, you can join me back here at 11 a.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time, that is 8 a.m. Pacific Standard Time for the opening ceremony of day two as we explore the sub-theme, Emerging Ways of Delivering Treatments. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the day. The we're going to have even more great presentations in the days ahead. So please join us and have a great rest of your day.